Welcome to Trail Angels, powered by Karen the Load. Today, our guest is Dr. Jessica Houston. She travels nationally and internationally, empowering thousands as an inspirational speaker and peak performance consultant. Dr. Houston's key messaging and platform are heavily influenced by her career in social work, K-12 administration, and higher education, which expands more than a decade. She currently serves as a professor at Purdue University and owns and operates a successful personal and professional development training company. Dr. Jessica is someone who has surmounted experiences of poverty, depression, and intimate partner violence. She said, I have not always been a confident, as confident as I am today. In fact, there were many instances when I wanted to pursue a promotion, but fear and self-doubt held me back. Although it appeared that I was living a great life, I knew that I was operating beneath my potential. Welcome, Dr. Jessica. Wow, thank you for having me. We are just thrilled. Mark and I have um, been talking about this, this episode. We, we went on a little vacation and a little road trip to the last few days. And as we were traveling, we were chatting about, about you and about um, this opportunity to talk. And really the thing that stuck out to me most, because I understand this completely, is that everybody around us thinks that we're having this great life. We're, we're happy, we're content, we're full of confidence, mm -hmm. which we are to a degree, right? But yet deep down inside behind that smile, there was fear and it held us back. And when I read that about you, I just, I latched onto that. I connected. Can you tell us just right off the bat, the bat a little bit about your story, about overcoming these experiences and how you were able to go from that fear and self-doubt holding you back to who you are today? Yes. So, so it, it definitely started in childhood with growing up in poverty and we actually lived in hotels before we went from family member to family member. We shopped at thrift stores, government assistance. And so a lot of that I believe impacted my confidence. And then I have my biological dad who is an attorney and that impacted me as well, because as I mentioned, I grew up in poverty. And so I was constantly trying to figure out how he, how was he okay with me living the way that I was living? And so I had a lot of resentment. And then to top it off, I did not necessarily like the way I looked. And so I would just look in the mirror and tear myself apart. And one of the things I've discovered is that everyone around you can tell you you're beautiful, you know, but it comes down to what you believe about you. And so it took me a very long time to be able to look in the mirror and say, you're beautiful. And to be able to look at myself and say, Jessica, I love you. And so that's where it all started. And so from that point, I was already broken. And then I went to college at the age of 17. I was a very smart young lady. How I had low self-confidence being that smart, I don't know, <laughs> but I did. And so I went to college. I graduated from high school a year early and I ran into someone who turned my life upside down. That's when I met the person who physically abused me, who stalked me. And that started a whole nother issue because I stayed in that relationship for six years. And it was during that time that I just didn't think that I could do any better. I thought to myself, he's the star football player. He's the star basketball player. If we break up, will there be anyone else who is interested in me? And as I got older, I recognized that that was a total lie. Like I'm married, right? So, <laughs> like, you know, in our minds, we come up with all of these ideas that are just so far from the truth, but you can talk yourself into believing it. And that's what I did. But thank goodness, as I matured, 
definitely once I had my daughter, I knew that I, I had to really believe in myself. I had to get my confidence up. I had to set the example. I didn't want a daughter growing up with low self-confidence. And so I think that was the main reason why I really, really decided to step into my confidence. And it was so weird because I was already married. And once I became confident, my husband noticed, I didn't even tell him I was changing anything, but he was like, something is different. It's like I had more pep in my step or something. But I think confidence is something that people can see and sense. I agree with that. And sometimes it takes someone else that we love so unconditionally that we are going to push past that fear and we're not going to let it hold us back anymore. And so whatever it took, that is such a blessing. I mean, in so many ways, your daughter is a huge blessing, but for that piece, that not only has changed your life, it has changed her life. And for generations to come, it will change the lives of your extended family. So, so Dr. Jessica, I love your story so far, and, and I'm sure that you'll tell us more of it uh, as we as we move forward here. But there seems to be a common denominator, <clears throat> excuse me, with with your story, with so many others, mm -hmm. that feeling of, of self-worth issues that uh, really plague us, that really put us in a position where we can't even think right sometimes mm -hmm. because we've lost that ability to to believe in ourselves, to 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 recognize what we truly are or can be. And when you talk about <clears throat> living beneath your potential, I, I, I got to say, I think that probably everybody feels that way to a degree at one time of their life or another. I look, I look at myself and you know what? The, the same thing was probably said with me as with you, with everybody else, which is your parents would go to parent teacher conference. And then what would they always say? Your child is capable of more and or better work. And, and, you know, that, that always used to stick to me. But coming from a uh, background that you have that was uh, poverty stricken there, you don't see a lot of success stories of people that uh, are able to leave poverty behind. How was that done? I, I know that you made some very conscious decisions. Mm -hmm. and, and you have perhaps made some decisions that will change generationally. But mm -hmm. how was that done? What was... I, I know so many people that struggle with that. They know they need to change, but they just can't They or they won't. Mm -hmm. Yes. For me, I think it's one of the reasons why I work a lot now. I work so hard now. I've become an achiever. I like to joke with my, my students and say I'm a recovering perfectionist. And <laughs> when I was a kid, when I was a kid, I would literally just dream about a nice house. Like, and now my daughter, she has it made, but it was like, because we, we had a home where we had to put pots out just to catch the rain. And so it was just like, I just want a nice house. I just want a nice car. I just want nice clothing. And so for me, that was my driver. And I knew the only way that I could get out of poverty was education. And so my thing was I graduated early. I was very focused in school. I was I was not a perfect kid. So don't. <laughs> uh, who, who is? I don't know many teenagers that are. <laughs> but I knew I just knew that education would take me further than most of my family members. So most of the people around me, you're correct. They, they were okay with where they were, but I knew that I needed, I needed to break that in what I call a, a curse of generational poverty. So I thought, you know what, I, I have to break this cycle because if I do not break it, it's going to continue. And the great thing is I went, I earned my bachelor's degree and then I went and earned a master's degree. And from that point, I was able to get my apartment and get a home. And then I thought, well, I may as well go ahead and get my PhD. Since I'm the first to do the bachelor's and the master's, I may as well go ahead and get my PhD. And so when I did that, it actually put me in another category. And then I started my business and I wrote a book. And so I just kind of added on, but I would say, 
definitely if someone is in that situation, you definitely want to make sure that you are somehow improving your skills. Even if you're not going to get a four year degree, can you get some type of certification? You've got to be able to set yourself apart in the workforce. And that's what I was able to do. One of the things there that you talk about with breaking that cycle of poverty, this generational cycle, was that you you had a dream really to to get out of it and to break it. And you had that vision of education being the way out. Um, and now because you've done that, you are the trail angel. You have blazed this trail for, for so many, for your students, for your family, and others that you don't know may be watching. And it gives me so much hope, really, that all of us can improve on wherever we're at in life. Just like you said, you know, set yourself apart. How do you do that? Are you improving in your skills or your daily skills of, of life? And are you doing what you can do to make life better yeah. and then to prove upon the past. Yeah. You, you know, you know, that's, that's my, that, that's my takeaway as well here is that so many of us and, and myself included, sometimes we get into a pattern of we're comfortable with the uh, status quo. Mm -hmm. We're comfortable with what is versus what could be. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I wonder from your perspective, what is the difference between the status quo person versus the one that, actually is able to have the fortitude and the courage to make the difference. Yes, I, I believe that you have to have that hunger and that desire for more. I, there are people, even people that I know personally, who are okay. They are okay with just having enough to pay their bills and nothing else. And for me, I'm, I'm not okay with that because I want more. I believe that we were placed on this earth to live an abundant lifestyle. No, you don't have to make millions of dollars or even hundreds of thousands of dollars, but I don't think you should have to struggle. And so when you've experienced struggle, that should really fire you up to say, I don't want to be here anymore. I, I don't want to depend upon the government to take care of me. I want to be able to take care of my family. And so I had that desire to do it. And I believe that that's the difference is that those who are achievers, that's their goal. Their goal is to be more, to do more, because they know that more is in them. And this is my belief. I believe that everyone has more in them, but everyone is not willing to unleash the more that is inside of them. And, and that's the key right there. It is that's the not, key, yeah. That's, that, that's the key, because I, I, I know so many people, and like I say, presence, uh, you know, I, I consider myself in that same boat sometimes is that where do I want to go from here? What do I want to do that's going to make a difference, not only in my life, but allow me to make a life or a difference in other people's lives as well. And so so when when, when we look at uh, what you do for a living, you are a professor at uh, Purdue University. And I know you speak uh, about institutional development uh, and how a company can become better. But I, I think that from our conversation that I'm hearing here and that we'd like to pursue, we, we'd like to talk about how peak performance can be achieved by the average person, how we can make those decisions that uh, we know that we need to, uh, to, to make in order to change, to, to become what we want to become. To change our daily lives, really. Yes, yes. And it's so important. There are so many components to experiencing peak performance in your life. And so a lot of times people think, oh, well, I just have to exercise or oh, I just have. Well, yeah, you, you should move. You should get movement because that's going to help you with your energy. And you have to put the right things in your body, into your body. That's also going to help with your energy. And then there is sleep. <laughs> yeah. This thing called sleep that a lot of people skimp on. And one of the things I've seen with this younger generation that they have this what you call hustle mentality and grind and I'll sleep whenever I'll sleep 20 years from now. But right now I'm not going to get any sleep. And that actually diminishes your performance. It diminishes your productivity. If you just think about yourself, I've had this happen to me. 
if I get a poor night's rest, you do not want to have to work with me the next day. (laughs) 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 I have to be honest. Yes, I have this experience. I've done the counseling. I've written books, but I'm moody. And so it impacts your performance when you're not getting enough rest. It impacts your performance when you're not getting that time alone. You know, I'm sure that, and that I'm sure that you love Mark, but there are some times that you need to get to yourself, to meditate, to read, whatever it is that you enjoy doing so that you can be prepared for your day. So that's one of the things that I do every single day. I start my day alone. I start my day alone. I, and I love that because I think that's the other missing piece that we are in such a hurry all the time to do this and this and this, you know, we're just kind of scattered. We're never really present Mm -hmm. in any of the moments of life. But if we start our day alone and train our mind to be still, which super hard for me to be, to just be in the moment and not be thinking about everything I need to do. Right. It, those are the days that I get, I am the most productive. I am the happiest. I'm probably a lot nicer to be around. <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> but it's key. It's, I mean, we have so, I keep using the word key today. There are so many key nuggets in, in this conversation. So sorry to interrupt. You can continue on with those peak performance and the things we need to do. Yes, yes. So definitely having that, that time alone to yourself. Uh, Another thing that's helpful is to journal and and write out some of your goals, your desires, some of the things that may be burdening you, that may be weighing you down. So you might not necessarily be able to talk it out with someone, but that's really good if you can. But just writing those things down, because I believe that, again, peak performance, it's, it's about wholeness. It's not necessarily just one component or two components, but it's about looking at every area of your life, your relationships, your finances. Yes, that does contribute to peak performance, because if you're worried about money, you're probably not going to be your best self. And so I, I love the idea of thinking about it in that way. So, so you talk about journaling, you talk about uh, quiet time that's, that's important. Uh, what I didn't hear you say is uh, the importance of looking at uh, Facebook or Instagram and, and uh, being, being on social media all the time. How, how has social media become a distraction to our wholeness? Oh, gosh. It's, it, it really, research has shown that it contributes to anxiety and depression because People, you look at other people's highlight reels, and that's what I like to call them. Because, you know, oh, I just got married. Oh, I just bought a new house. Oh, I just bought a new car. Oh, we just got this. And you're looking like, well, my life doesn't look like that. Oh, we're relaxing on the beach. Oh, we work a five hour week, you know, and you start to think, well, goodness, my life is just not like that. And so it 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 definitely can cause you to begin to compare yourself. And one of the things I I always share with young people is never compare yourself to those that you see on social media because they only post what they want you to see. Mm. Exactly. I wish people would be real. Yes. Be vulnerable. And that's, that's where, you know, they're almost living this, this pretend life too. Yes. Yes as opposed to showing the reality that sometimes life is hard. It is. A lot of times life is kind of messy, but that doesn't mean we can't have joy. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we can't, you know, continue to pursue our dreams. It's just that life is life. And and really, I feel like for for us, it's those challenges. it's, It's the hard times that have helped us to become who we are. Definitely. We are, I believe, you know, we're, we're more beautiful. We're more, mm-hmm. um, we have a, a greater love for each other, but for others as well because of those experiences. And I think people are missing out 
uh, the whole part of life, if they just look at social media as this is the truth. You live and you learn. And what I've discovered in, I have younger siblings, but also in teaching, they, they share how it can like ruin their entire day if they post something and only three people like it. It's like, <laughs> it's horrible. And I'm like, but it, it, they take it personally. And I, I just want people to understand that, that the social media should not define you. You know, the, the number of followers that you have should not define you. What you would want to be concerned about is your real life. And, and trying to get to that place where you can experience authentic happiness. Again, life is not going to be perfect. And one of the things I've had to learn is how to find peace and comfort and gratitude, even during those rough times. That's, that's been the thing that I've worked on a lot. That, that's a tough, that's a tough thing. I think we all beat ourselves up, don't we? Yes. In that, but you know, I, I look at you, Dr. Jessica, and, and you, you, you seem like you're the, the, the picture of self-confidence, but something that you wrote about yourself that I just wanted to explore just for a minute. You said that uh, there were instances that you wanted to pursue a promotion, but fear and self-doubt held you back. What did that look like in your life? I, I, Again, people told me that I was smart. I graduated from high school early. In college, I studied, but I didn't do my best, and I still graduated with honors. <laughs> so I, you're it, a smart pants, Dr. Jessica. It was just this, this inner, it was the, the negative chatter in my mind that despite the evidence, I still didn't believe that I could do it. I still didn't believe that I was good enough. And I believe that with every level that you go to, there is a little bit of doubt if you're honest. I know for me, if I'm going to a, 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 an engagement, for example, maybe there's 20,000 people and I'm just like, oh my goodness, what did I do? I, can I back out? You know, so, and I've had that happen to me, like, oh my goodness, what have I signed up for? You know, there is this level of, of a nervousness, but what I've discovered is that preparation will help you to become more confident. And so I decided that, you know what? You have to over prepare. And that will help you at least feel a little more confident. And so that's when I started stretching myself little by little because I knew that I was prepared. So I wasn't necessarily I leaning on me, but I was leaning on what I knew. Right, but I think something that you just said I think is critically important, and that is, is that uh, preparation was the key. I think yes. that there are a lot of people that might be listening that say, well, you know what? I'm not as smart as Dr. Jessica. I, I struggled through high school. I, I, I uh, didn't uh, go past, past high school to do any college. I didn't do anything like that. But something that you just said, I think is really important. And that is, is that uh, as we prepare, we become what we are looking to become. Would you say that's true? Yes, definitely, definitely. And I, I truly believe again, that everyone has something inside of them something that they are really good at. And this is the thing, I, 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 I decided that I was going to use education to get me out of poverty, but everyone does not have to take that path. So I do wanna make that clear because maybe you're good at styling hair. Maybe you're a great cook. Maybe you love to clean. Do you know that people hire people to clean their houses <laughs> or they hire people to clean their businesses? So maybe you're a good organizer. Maybe you are good with technology. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you've got to go to school for four years, but there is something. I'm going to challenge your, your, your listeners. There is something that you are better at than most people. And that is is the skill, that is the talent, that is the gift that I'm going to challenge you to tap into. Wow. That's I, I, I think that's a great uh, invitation uh, because you're, you're right. You know, you, you talk about uh, how you teach women entrepreneurs how to profit from their brilliance, not, not uh, profit 
if you are brilliant, but from their brilliance. Right. Because you're saying, and what I hear you saying is, is that everybody has a tool that they can use that is better than maybe somebody else's. Yes. I, I, I love that. I think that is so important. So I, I have a follow-up question. That, let, me just, let me just ask okay. that follow-up question there. And, and I'm asking for a friend, okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, mm. You know, I, 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 look at, I look at where we've gone during the last 15 months. I look at myself who was one day working in an office building with, with people all around me to working from home. And I'll tell you what, Skype and Zoom and everything else in between is, is something that we're all familiar with. But in that time, my friend, I think, is experiencing some burnout. Mm. Uh, how, how would you suggest that uh, to our listeners, because I, I would bet that uh, I'm, I mean, my friend is, <laughs> is probably not the only one that's experiencing burnout in their lives right now. Mm -hmm. how, how would you address that? Yes, there's there are many ways that but for me, I believe it's important to take a time out. Again, if you are one that you go and you go and you go, you know what? That list is going to be there tomorrow. And if you cross everything off today, tomorrow, you'll add 10 more things. So. Mm -hmm. So I believe that the first prescription is to take a step back and do an analysis of everything that you are doing. How are you spending your time? Are you allowing other people to put their burden on you? Are you allowing other people to bring their issues to you? Are you saying yes when you really want to say no? And, and in, in my, my latest book, Profitable Conversations, I have a chapter titled, Value Your Yes. So I believe, this is just my belief, I believe that burnout results from repeatedly saying yes when you really want to say no. I believe that. I'm sure my friend will really appreciate that. <laughs> Somehow that, you know, you described someone I know really well, perfectly. And, and it's something. Are you talking about my friend as well? I, I am talking about <laughs> my friend. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's something that um, we do have to learn. It's a skill that we have to learn. And honestly, I was forced into that several years ago with my health that I had to say, no, I can't do that. As much as I may have wanted to in some ways and other ways, it was great because I had an excuse that, that I could then learn to start saying it. I had a difficult time having the timeouts. I had a difficult time you know, being alone and spending that time alone, I felt guilty. Mm. But I learned something. I learned skills. I learned to embrace something that wasn't natural to me that became a lifeline for me. And, and I'm so grateful that I learned that a few years ago. And yeah, I was kind of forced into it. But it's something that I know when I start feeling that burnout or I'm running too much, I can mm -hmm. stop, I can take that time out and I can look. And it's pretty easy to see the things I've stopped doing that time alone mm -hmm. or that getting out and going for a walk and exercising. And so it's easy to pull it back together and rein it in and feel like, you know, I have a little more you know, pep in my step, like you said earlier. Mm -hmm. with, with it, is. it is. I believe that that self-awareness is key to ensuring that you do not reach that place of burnout. It's important to really know because you can tell when you're doing too much, but many times people who are helpers and givers are notorious for doing too much because 
you don't want to say no. You don't want to appear mean. You don't want to appear selfish. For me, that's like the worst thing you could say about me is that I'm selfish. And so there were times when I, I had so many things to do and I'm, I'm putting all of my stuff on the back burner because this person needs my help and this person needs my help. And I had to stop and say, Jessica, you need you. You can't you can't continue doing this. It's going to impact your health. And it does get to the point where you're not able to sleep well because your mind is going, oh, I got to do this and I got to do this. And I got. So, yes, you do have to take that step back and say. I've got to prioritize. You're, you're talking about both of us here. Uh, Annette and I, uh, about a year ago, took the Enneagram. Uh, you're probably familiar with that there that uh, talks about uh, different styles. And that is the helper, and I'm the achiever. <laughs> and, and, and so you pegged us both absolutely correctly. Uh, as you're talking about, my friend, that was great advice for me. Because as an achiever, I, I've got to slow down and sometimes reevaluate, take a step back and analyze. Uh, because when I find that I don't do that, everything becomes just rather mediocre. And I don't achieve to the levels of of my expectation. And 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 in that the same way when it comes to being a helper, there she is I, a, I can give and give and give yeah. and then I have nothing left to mm -hmm. take care of me, like you said. And it does take a toll. It takes a toll on us physically and emotionally and and spiritually if we don't have that balance. Um, you know, we're talking about how to have this live this life of peak performance and not just, you know, be average, to go from that average to extraordinary. One of the points that you talked about was that each of us has something that we're really good at, mm -hmm. that um, we're better than, than most people. And I remember several years ago, we, um, we had a young family. Mark was still in school and, and I, I had been working and then after we had our, our first daughter, I didn't go back to work. We were trying to make it off of what we had saved during the summer while he was in school. And it really, we were falling short. And so, like you said, those finances play in into our overall performance of everything. And I had to look at my passions. I had to look at things that I was good at and I created a business. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get my degree. I, you know, I, I didn't, I don't have a, a bachelor's degree. I don't have a master's or a, I like to say I have a PhD in, in life, <laughs> but, yeah. um, but I've, I have was awarded patents. I was, you know, and I've, and I've had businesses and now here we are really doing what we're really passionate about and helping others. Yeah know that they're not alone in a, in a very unique and different way than, than what I ever envisioned, but yet helping, helping people all over the world, which is amazing. Yes. And, and so I love that, that point. And I don't want to just completely brush by it because there are things, but would you say it takes time to sit down and reflect about really, you know, journaling possibly about those things that what am I passionate about? What could I, what service could I offer that could create a business? What can I do? What would you recommend in narrowing that down so that they can again move forward in their life? Yes. Yeah, so uh, what I like to think about, first of all, is it easy? <laughs> because you don't want to try to do something that's too complicated because you're not going to stick with it. So first it needs to be easy. It does need to be something that you're fairly good at that you can do without stressing yourself out. So it should be easy. I believe personally it should be fulfilling if it's going to be something that you're going to pour a lot of time and energy into. And then third, I believe that if it's going to be a business, it, it needs to be profitable. So easy, fulfilling and profitable. And one of the ways that you can really figure out 
what it is that you're good at is you can think about what people come to you for or what they come to you for advice on. And sometimes it can be so simple and that, and this is the thing, we always seem to minimize what we are really good at. And it's like, oh, everyone is good at that. And so I find myself doing it too. And I remember when I first started speaking and I would be sharing ideas with my sister and I'm like, oh, but that's too simple. She's like, no, 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 no. Everyone doesn't read as much as you know, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like her. I can send her a PowerPoint and say, can you design this for me? Because this is just getting to be a little too much for me. And she'll do it easily, quickly. And so just think of those things that really come to you easily. You may just be good with technology, with computers, with problem solving, with um, helping people to pick out the right clothing to wear. It's things that are so simple can really turn into something big which they really can. And I, and I love that you pointed out that we think it's too simple, but that's because it's a gift of ours. Yes. It's something that, that, you know, maybe does come naturally and we enhance it by working to improve it. And so that's why it has been a little easier for us, but for others, it's not. It's not. And, and so like you had mentioned, you know, we have these things within us. We have, and if we are satisfied with the mundane, if we are satisfied with the mediocre, what would you suggest that the individual does to recognize maybe there's something I'm avoiding to be, you know, is, is that an issue that they're maybe avoiding something and that's why they don't want to get out of that comfort zone? And sometimes, it, it can be that you are just so accustomed to being a victim, to being, oh, woe is me, oh, this is unfair, that you're not motivated to move because that is your story. And there have been young ladies that I've mentored and it was the same way with them. It was just like, they just want you to have this pity party with them but I'm saying, no, you've got this skill. Why don't you just do this? And so it it does have to come from within. I don't I don't think it's a situation where they don't know what to do. It's that they're not willing to do it. And and sometimes it's a matter of I don't want to get out of my comfort zone. What if I fail? And I say, well, what if you succeed? And so yeah. sometimes again we overthink things when just take that first step of identifying something that you are really good at and start there. It's, it seems so hard sometimes, <laughs> you know, I, you know, there, there are things that uh, I've wanted to do. I've wanted to write a book for a long time. And every time I, I sit down to do it, I think to myself, you know, what do I have to offer? What can I, what can I say that hasn't already been said? What can I give that hasn't already been given? And I think that we we set ourselves up sometimes to to underperform or or not perform at all because we we feel that we don't have it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so true. And I, I thought the same thing, but I knew I knew that I had to do it. And this is the thing: maybe your book <clears throat> is very similar to someone else's book, but it's you but they are not you. They don't have your story. And the people who are drawn to you are going to read the book from you. And that's, that's the thing that I think we miss is that we're so close to it that we don't really see that. No, it's your extra seasoning that you put in that book that's gonna set your book apart, even though it might be similar to someone else's book. So, so whether it's a book or anything else, that That's right. that that sizzle that we all need can be found. It just needs to be. We, we, it's we, within we need, us. And it really is. You know, a lot of times, I love how you use that that seasoning. Um, often, I'll I'll be asked, "Well, how do you make this?" I I tend to. I might be a good cook. Let's just put it that way. And, but I don't really use recipes. 
-hmm. I just do the, I add a little of this, add a little of that. And, <laughs> and, you know, and our children, I feel bad for them because they'll ask me how to make it. And I'm, you'll just know, she says. <laughs> no, I started taking it and I'll, you know, I'll put a little in my hand and then I'll take it and measure it. Just because I know that's, that's not their skill. Mm -hmm. It's not their gift. And, and I think they really do have it. There's that fear that holds them back. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's putting our special touch on it. Mm -hmm. It's putting that, that love. And, and you're exactly right. And we have gifts. We have our own story mm -hmm. that can touch someone in a way that no one else can. And, and abilities, whether it's a parenting skill or being a friend or or a leader, whatever, whatever the case might be. Some of the best leaders I've ever had have been those that uh, didn't have advanced degrees, but were those that uh, that knew how to deal with inner human relations and and uh, knew how to you know knew how to create an atmosphere of of production mm -hmm. uh, that uh, was better than 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 others. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I've got a question for you here. I, you know, th this is an intriguing conversation, and, and and I really appreciate your your insights because you're you're right on the money. Uh, but I, I'm curious when when I talked with someone like when I talk with someone like you, I like to ask the question: Was there ever a time in your studies, in your schooling, or in your life? that all of a sudden that proverbial bell in your head just went off. It was like, ding, ding, ding. I get it now. Was there any epiphanies while you were going to school or any other time that made you realize that that's the secret sauce right there? Mm. I think for me, everything in my life has just been in layers. And so I don't always get the ding, 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 but it'll come after I've tested a couple of things. So for me, it's been like a lot of trial and error and learning and okay, so I can't do it that way. And a lot of deep thought and reflection and, and me just coming back and, and saying, okay, so you did this and that didn't quite work. So how can you change that? How can you improve the next time? So for me, it hasn't necessarily been this one huge moment, but it's been just taking those small steps and, and being reflective about what I did and what I can do better the next time around. So you didn't look at it as a failure. Right. You looked at it as an opportunity to learn and to grow from. Yes. Yes. And I love to learn. I love to learn and I love to teach. And so for me, it's I believe that we're going to encounter challenges. And so you can't get stuck in them because that's one of the things that can hinder you from peak performance is what they say in um, the athletic realm is, you know, never focus too much on a win and never focus too much on a loss because both of them can hinder you and it's true. And so that's one of the things that I do. It's like, okay, all right, I'm disappointed. All right, it didn't work. I give myself a, a li very limited time to have a pity party or get upset or whatever I wanna do and then it's time to move on. And it's important to not discount that, acknowledge it and then move on. And that's important in every every realm of our lives, I think, is that we, you know, the wins, the successes, and the failures. And the failures really aren't failures. No. If we will learn and apply those things to our life for the next opportunity that comes around. Yes. So one of the things that I also like to ask to our guest is about trail angels. And is there someone or an experience in your life where someone who's really been a trail angel for you. Hmm. I, I'm, I'm thinking I had this professor in undergrad, um, Dr. Nicholas Cooper Luter. He saw something in me and I do not to this day know what made him say this to me one day, because at that time I was struggling with low self-confidence. I was partying way too much. 
<laughs> I was in a physically abusive relationship. And he said to me, you are going to do well in life. He said, for some reason, I believe, and this may be what planted that seed of what I'm doing now. He said, I believe that you are going to earn a doctorate degree. I believe that you're going to travel the world speaking. Wow. Now that just brings chills every time I say it. And I haven't said it often because it's like, I, when he said it, I couldn't even fathom it. And now he already had a PhD, like one of the smartest um, people that I know, the smartest person that I know. Um, and I just couldn't believe that he was saying that to me. And as soon as I finished my PhD, I did a search to find him. And I told him what I, I was doing. And at that time, I was writing my first book. So we sat down, we talked about it. He gave me pointers. And so he is definitely one that he believed in me when I didn't. And I think we all can use someone like that. Yeah. We all can. And I am grateful for those that believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. And I can completely understand that that's where things shifted for you. And I'm sure that you began to look and thought, well, why does he think that about me? Yes. I laughed. I, I, I would have too. I, you know, I'm sure I, I have when others have told me that as well. But deep down inside, something resonated. Yes. And we've talked a lot about what's inside us. You know, mm -hmm. on and off, we pointed at that. And we, we have that within us. We have that to, to go, to help us to go from the average to the extraordinary in life. And it doesn't come all at once. It comes piece by piece, step by step, as we travel this path and this journey in life. But I just want to thank you again for joining us today. Um, Dr. Jessica, it has been just a privilege to have you here. Is there anything you would like to share with our audience in closing? Yes, I just I just want to encourage them to search themselves to find out what it is that is stopping them from being the best that they can be. I really I really want to see people unleash those gifts, unleash the joy, unleash the, the peace and the happiness. It's all right in there. And, and sometimes it's, it's your environment. Sometimes it's the people who you are around who are bringing you down. Have you ever been in a great mood and then you got around someone who was just a Debbie Downer and they brought your mood down. And so I have this saying, and it is defend your happiness. It's going to be your job. It's not anyone's job to make you happy. And we could do a whole nother segment on that, <laughs> but, but it's your job to defend your happiness, to not let someone come in and steal your peace. Wow. Powerful closing words. Thank you, friends, for joining us today. We hope that you've enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Jessica Houston. As we discussed the opportunities and desires within that will help us go from average to extraordinary, to defend your happiness, to not let someone steal your peace. Each of us have a story to share. Author Brene Brown reminds us that owning our story is the bravest thing you will ever do. The stories and experiences our guests share inspire us as well as help us to grow and connect with others. We invite you to become a part of Karen the Load community through social media, as well as to share the site with those you know. We are stronger together. Keep Karen. <laughs>